Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss machine learning case studies. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our series speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. It's uh, another beautiful day here in Connecticut. And I hope that uh, the audience, wherever you are, is having a good day and good weather. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do with this series, and, you know, I was just thinking about it, it's actually we're about a, a year and a half into the series now. Uh, one of the questions that I often get uh, revolves around how people are using some of these technologies. And so when we're coming up with topics uh, for this year, I thought it'd be good to pick a couple of industries and do some case studies or use cases to show different ways that people are already exploiting machine learning and perhaps uh, get people thinking about new ways to use um, machine learning in their own environment. So with that in mind, we're gonna look at three industries today, insurance, pharma, and healthcare, and take a look at uh, really some of the advances. I mean, things have changed a lot in the last few years. If you were to look at uh, the landscape in uh, the business press or the popular press five years ago, you certainly wouldn't have been inundated uh, as you are today with stories about machine learning and artificial intelligence and the robots are coming and all the other good stuff. So let's take a look and try and separate the uh, the fact from the fiction and get an idea of where people are already using the technology, uh, but more importantly, perhaps, how we see it going in the next couple of years. So with that in mind, the agenda is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the foundations for industry industry-specific machine learning applications, uh, what you should be looking for, what are the attributes of problems uh, that make them well-suited to machine learning. And then we'll look at the three industries in turn, insurance, pharma, and healthcare. And for each, I want to look at an application or two, uh, the types of applications that are suitable, and then an example and finally, we'll look at how uh, industries are being transformed or will be transformed with machine learning in the next few years. So to start out, why did I pick insurance, pharma, and healthcare? What do they have in common? Well, first of all, they have a lot of data. And one thing that uh, we'll see and you know, we'll come back to, we've talked about this in, in previous webinars, is that the way uh, artificial intelligence is maturing there's much more of a focus on data relative to algorithms than there was five or 10 years ago, certainly. So you have to have data, and these industries all have it. They've got historical data, they've got uh, things that are highly structured, like customer databases, uh, taxonomies, et cetera, where you can just go look stuff up and they're in, uh, in very uh, structured, repeatable form. And then they have, in general, uh, for each of them, different uh, different types of data. But they have stuff that I, I call deep structure, which um, is popularly known as unstructured. I don't think data can actually be unstructured or it wouldn't be useful. It just takes more work to find this structure. So if you're dealing with natural language, uh, in journals, in text, in case notes, it could be uh, 
audio files or video files that need to be processed to find the structure and then find the meaning in there. But each of these industries has a lot of it. The other type of data that uh, we've talked about recently in, uh, in one of the webinars is streaming data. And what we're going to look at today is the impact of integrating streaming data, uh, which is data in motion that's going to be analyzed in motion, with the historical data uh, to start to derive some insights. And streaming data uh, relative to the insurance industry and pharma and healthcare could include things like telematics, when you have a fully instrumented car that's reporting on its condition, uh, weather information, things that are uh, changing constantly, biometrics, let's say we have sensors, you've got a Fitbit, you have some sort of a uh, device that's producing data about you, and even news feeds. And we'll see uh, as we kind of pull all this together towards the end, how each of these may be used as input to a machine learning system to uh, give you some insights to redirect behavior. What they also have in common, these three industry, is uh, relatively well-defined vocabularies, data models, and taxonomies. So if you were to uh, look at um, any aspect of insurance, whether you're looking at auto, property, uh, PNC, property and casualty, life insurance, business insurance, there's generally a set of claim codes that, uh, that you can interchange. Uh, people understand some of the basics there. And that makes it easier for us to look at opportunities for leveraging this data. So in, uh, in pharma and healthcare, uh, the basics of biology and chemistry and biochemistry and uh, neurophysiology are all, the, the representations um, are all pretty standard. And finally, there are regulatory issues. Each of these uh, industries uh, is subject to a number of regulations whether it be uh, regional, state, nation, international. And that can sometimes impact the types of analysis that we do and the type of uh, audit trail that we need to have in order to meet the regulatory issues or regulatory requirements. So before we get into the, the specific cases, I wanted to um, bring this diagram up for folks that weren't with us a couple of months ago when I talked about the changes in machine learning. And here, what I'm just showing is over time, and the extreme left would be, uh, let's say, the 1950s, 1960s, early on in uh, machine learning uh, up to the current day, the relative importance or emphasis on algorithms and rules versus data. And so things have shifted. We used to try and make, put all the smarts, if you will, in the algorithms. So things would be heavily rule-based and we would try and solve problems using a, a minimum of data because frankly, that's what we had access to. And so the systems themselves reflected the intelligence or the belief system, if you will, of the people that were designing the systems. And what we're getting to today is more and more uh, systems where we're trusting the data to provide uh, relationships and patterns that will explain the behavior or will at least provide the insights uh, that don't need to be pre-programmed. So that's kind of the, the shift, if you will. One last uh, slide just to do a level set, folks that are interested in the industries perhaps, but haven't been with us when we talked about uh, machine learning. One of the concepts that's uh, very important to understanding how these things are being applied in the three industries we're looking at today is the idea of deep learning. And when we talk about deep learning, we're talking about a system, normally uh, one that any machine learning system is one that will improve its performance based on experience with data. But in particular, when we talk about deep learning, we're talking about a system that has multiple levels or layers, if you will, um, where we start out with um, an input level that represents the, uh, the variables that we can actually observe. So if uh, in this example, this was a uh, a deep learning system to identify objects in a picture. And you start out by uh, trying to identify um, one level of uh, features and face 
looking for edges, and you might be looking for edges in a picture by looking at pixel by pixel, um, trying to find things that are the same brightness or the same contrast between that pixel and its uh, surrounding pixels, or the same color as it's represented digitally. And gradually, you go from one layer into something that uh, you just pass it now, the edges. And now we try to identify, OK, we have all these edges identified at the next level. What type of shape are we looking for? And so we have the rules there that would help us to identify geom uh, geometrically what sort of shapes, and then get into further and further refinements. So you can have uh, an arbitrary number of levels. And in some of the complex systems, uh, one that Microsoft has reported on recently that they do for uh, uh, um, speech recognition or um, image recognition at 150 layers. But you always have an input layer and an output layer, and the layers in the middle are considered to be hidden. And the reason that's important is you can tune the algorithms, um, looking at different sorts of activation based on uh, you know, your, your preconceived notions, your beliefs about uh, the rules that you would apply to get from uh, one type of feature to another, but you don't actually see when the system is operational what's going on in the middle. It, it tends to, you know, for any sufficiently complex system, that tends to become a black box. So with that as background, let's take a look at how this works. So we're going to start with insurance, and for each of the three industries, we'll, we'll start by looking at what are the major use cases uh, that are particular to that industry. So virtually any business that wants to look at machine learning will be looking at it for things like marketing, sales, uh, communication, um, operations, uh, perhaps a supply chain um, optimization. But today, we're just going to look at things that are particular to the specific industry. So for, uh, for insurance, speaking broadly, uh, looking at auto, property, and casualty, and life, as I say, there are other categories of uh, insurance, and most of these lessons uh, will be applicable there. But it's basically, I mean, the insurance industry is about risk management. So we want to be able to uh, understand, uh, predict for an individual that's getting a policy or a business that's getting a policy, what's the likelihood that there will be a claim? What's the likelihood that if there is a claim, it'll be serious? Let's um, look at improving the customer experience and maybe looking at some dynamic um, approaches to this pricing. And also, for uh, whenever you're dealing with money, one of the issues is fraud detection, and that's uh, of particular importance in insurance. One of my friends was just involved in an accident this week where someone uh, hit them, and it was done to uh, to be able to file a false claim. So. That's a big part of insurance, and being able to predict that uh, will certainly improve performance. On the second column, what we want to look at, uh, thinking back in terms of that uh, diagram with the importance of data, is what type of data do we have available to us for the industry? So for insurance, we've certainly got customer data. We have uh, demographics and historical record. The company that holds my life insurance policy has uh, certain information about me, I have uh, medical information, the company that has my um, automobile insurance has my driving record, uh, the company that has the, uh, the homeowner's policy has different information, but each of them has information about me and how I've interacted with insurance companies in the past. Now, if you're insuring uh, property, which would include, let's say you're doing uh, even an automobile policy, now you need to know about the person that's insuring it. You also need to know about the property itself. So data about that and some local and regional data to put it in context. So insuring a three-bedroom house that's 2,000 square feet in one neighborhood is going to have perhaps different rules associated with it or different relationships, not necessarily formal rules, uh, than another location. You also, uh, there is data that's streaming, whether or not it's collected. And so this can be things like uh, real-time or near real-time personal data, if you're insuring a person. Uh, if you could track 
how they are behaving. You might want to change the relationship that you have with them from an insurer's standpoint. And that could be anything from seeing a sudden change in the, uh, the sentiment of social media posts that they're putting out to biometrics. Again, if I'm wearing a Fitbit and you can detect that my heart rate is changing, you might want to look at other things. But you might also be uh, interested in looking at the impact of different news items. There's a, a fire within 50 miles of me. What does that mean in terms of my um, my risk as a policyholder? There's change in the weather. Should there be a change in the policy? And when I uh, talk about this, I want to make sure that we understand that this is the streaming part, not the uh, regional data for the property itself, because it's one thing, that's like the difference between weather and climate, right? We know what the climate is, we know what is expected, but there are always things that are um, changing during the course of the day, the week, the month, etc., and those could be used to change uh, pricing, they could be used to um, help direct behavior. So let's look at what's being done today and then as we go through uh, some of the other examples, we'll come back and see how we might change these for the future to take better advantage of the data that we have. So our first uh, look is a proof of concept for auto insurance pricing. And this is from AXA Insurance. And for each of these, uh, there's usually a uh, like a, an online reference, and when you get the slides next week or the link to them, there'll be references so you can see where the uh, the numbers are coming from. So in the case of AXA, their historical data tells them that somewhere between seven and ten percent of their insured drivers, the people that have policies with them, will cause an accident annually. Uh, and if you think about uh, auto insurance, uh, there's a difference between causing the accident and being in an accident. So at this point, they're looking at it and saying, okay, this is the percentage of drivers that are likely to cost this money because they're at fault. However, only about 1% of the accidents result in a payout that's over $10,000. So clearly, those are the um, policyholders that you want to um, scrutinize more carefully, uh, perhaps charge more perhaps offer education. There's a lot of things that you would want to do with that information if you could do a better job of predicting which of the people that you insure is most likely to have an accident that's a high payout. So the challenge was how to use technology to improve uh, the predictive um, ability of their uh, systems over the current methods. And in this case, this is one that's um, been used recently by Google as a, uh, as a reference account, if you will. So they're using machine learning uh, in the Google environment. And the way they did it was to start by identifying 70 risk factors, roughly 70. And those would include things that you might normally think of, the age of the insured, and remember this is uh, auto insurance, the address, um, and the address, uh, may be factored in because it's going to, uh, to give you a higher rate or a higher probability. It's a denser region. We know that most accidents happen within a few miles of home. So if your uh, address is Manhattan, you may be more likely to be involved in an accident than if your address is in uh, Montana, as an example. The vehicle type, previous accidents, your history. So again, this is the, the historical data. The original channel, how did you buy the insurance? The age of the car, the total is a say of about 70 different factors. Now, if you think about how uh, these things have been priced in the past, a lot of the pricing algorithms have used uh, some number of risk factors, uh, likely not quite 70, but uh, for each of them, there would be a weight assigned, there would be people who would look at the historical data and try and uh, determine what was correlation, what was causation, uh, and what, uh, how these things go together, and place it based on a set of rules. What they did in this example was to use uh, TensorFlow on the Google Cloud and a machine learning engine, and going back to that uh, previous diagram, only you now it's left to right instead of top to bottom, 
they built a uh, machine learning um, solution that took as input those 70, uh, 70 variables. And for practical purposes, we think of this as a 70 dimension input vector uh, going into a fully connected neural network. Now, I mentioned that the, uh, the Microsoft example, when we were looking at uh, translation and, and speech, was 150 layers. In this case, we're only looking at three hidden layers, and that was enough for them to uh, get to resolution at a, a performance level that I'll talk about in just a minute. But basically, it's fully connected, so they're looking at the relationship of all these um, dimensions to each other uh, in a convolutional neural network, which is a feed-forward network. We don't need to get uh, too deep in the weeds on this, but if people are interested, we can follow up afterwards and talk about uh, more of the technology that was used. But we go in and go from that 70, look at the relationships which are uh, impacting it, and get down to the very end, where basically it puts a, uh, a risk factor associated with that instance. So if you think, you know, I've got a million policyholders, then you would have to run this for a million, um, I think of it as a, a million rows in a database, but each one of those would have the 70 risk factors then gets analyzed, we look for the features, go through it, those three steps, and what comes out, you may not even know at this point, with three levels you can probably work it out, but the, the relationship between, let's say, the vehicle type and the original channel may be marginal, but you know that may be something that, that has a significant influence. So we take this and their uh, result in this proof of concept was that they were able to predict with about 78% accuracy uh, the high-risk uh, policyholders. And this was done by training the system using historical data. So you would put it in as, uh, if you didn't, as if you didn't know what had happened in going through and then predicting. Uh, but since it's a proof of concept here, it's not operational, they could look at it and see based on the data that they had uh, whether or not they would have been able to accurately predict, and the result was about 78%, which is higher than uh, their their current method, and also uh, significantly higher than the first AI method they tried, which is a, a random forest approach. So by being, being able to identify uh, an appropriate set, I won't say the right set of risk factors, because perhaps they could do 80% uh, of this with 50% of the, the variables. I don't have that data available. But they identified a reasonable working set of input variables that gave them the performance they need. They can optimize their cost uh, and based on this, uh, op offer to their clients new services. We're going to move uh, through the industries uh, fairly rapidly now, but we're going to come back to insurance because that's one where uh, maybe we can, if we have time, get uh, a bit of a discussion going. But that's the first example using uh, a deep learning approach. So now in pharma, and in pharma we're talking about uh, pharmaceutical research here. So the basic use cases that we want to look at, uh, drug discovery, identifying new drugs, clinical trials, the process of assigning people to trials uh, so that we get the right population, a meaningful population, and then basic uh, biochemical analysis. So the data that we have available includes, uh, as I said, we, we know certain biochemical principles. Those don't generally change. We may have uh, new discoveries about the relationship between certain um, structures, so it may, it may get updated. We may find that something that we've believed in the past uh, is incorrect. That happens in science. There's not really uh, much in science that's completely settled. But we have that information, so we can model um, molecular structure and the interrelationships. Uh, we can look at clinical trial case data, so we can see uh, every time we do something, we can record the um, the outcomes, so we can use that uh, historical data in future tests. And of course, uh, journals, news, and other forms of uh, deeply structured natural language data uh, that we would like to include as we're trying to either discover a new drug, uh, do the assignment of people to the trials, or analyze the, uh, 
the results. Now, I have uh, this slide just to show kind of the, the scale of the problem or the, the opportunity. I was trying to be an um, optimist here. So this is a current report, 2017, and right now there are over 240 uh, immuno-oncology treatments being uh, developed for people with cancer. So if you think of those 240 different treatments, to get to that, there was a much larger funnel of things that were being considered and then rejected. Uh, anything that will help the pharma companies to uh, identify candidate compounds um, more efficiently is going to speed the process. And so that's what we want to look at today. The uh, one approach here that, um, again, you'll get all these references afterwards, but this is for machine learning, uh, space optimization for drug discovery. And here, the problem that they were working with is virtual screening. So you have all this data about different um, uh, components, ingredients, if you will, and their uh, chemical properties and things that might be combined. But even with uh, the availability of uh, high-speed computers and clusters that can operate certainly much faster every year, year after year, it's still a computationally intensive problem uh, and virtually intractable to try every combination. So what you want to be able to do is to uh, weed out things that you know are going to be a conflict um, as quickly as possible. And this is one approach that was uh, a publication date on this, okay, 2013, so just a few years ago, looked using machine learning, the similar type of uh, system that I, I mentioned before, only here it's a combination of support vector machines, neural networks, and random forest, uh, where it's kind of a hybrid approach using three different machine learning approaches, if you will, to determine when there were uh, known conflicts in the chemistry, the biochemistry. And their results on this, again, using three different approaches to machine learning, was that they improved the throughput. They were able to um, identify uh, things that needed to be discarded by 50%, and they had a 90% accuracy. Um, uh, so they weren't discarding things that would actually, uh, could have been promising, because that's another, uh, certainly a, a false, um, false positive, uh, is costly. So that's one approach. This one uh, was very recent. It was uh, February of 2017. And in this case, it's University of Toronto looking at uh, accelerating the discovery of drugs with machine learning. And here they've developed some new algorithms that are uh, fundamentally based on three-dimensional modeling of the structure, the molecular structure, the protein molecules, in uh, basically building a mathematical model for structural biology, if you will. And I don't claim to be an authority on this by any means, um, but by going to a 3D model that they could then um, map from that model as input, as an input vector to a machine learning model, they could find out relationships that were going to work and those that weren't going to work. And by finding things, again, looking for things that weren't going to work and discarding those earlier on, this is something uh, that saved time and time is money. It also means you can bring the, uh, the compound to market earlier. Uh, and there are lots of uh, business and uh, societal benefits to that, certainly. So that's one from this year. Here's another one, uh, April, getting it closer. And in this case, it's using deep learning, the multi-level with the hidden, hidden layers that I talked about uh, for drug um, drug design, drug uh, um, research. And in this case, uh, it was the goal of this research was to uh, be able to identify uh, potential solutions using smaller data sets. So in some cases, we have uh, lots and lots of data. And as I 
showed in one of the earlier slides, we can sort of brute force uh, find inferences based on uh, looking at lots and lots of combinations of data. But sometimes when you don't have it, uh, we need to be maybe a little more um, clever, I don't want to say smarter, but in terms of the algorithms that we use to identify uh, potential or reject uh, things that are going to fail later on. And so this at Stanford, just a couple of months ago, they uh, had this published, is an approach using um, a smaller data set, but with, uh, with deep learning. So that's pretty recent in the pharma space. And then we have, uh, just a few weeks ago, IBM patenting a machine learning model or machine learning models for drug discovery. And you'll have, uh, have this reference, as I said, in the, uh, the package when you get it next week. But here what they've done is done a business process or a method patent, if you will, for the approach they're using to identify uh, potential drugs for specific um, disorders or diseases. And this was just uh, also April of this year, just a few days after the, the Stanford announcement. So it remains to be seen, I um, have to look at this in a little more detail, but the actual impact of this on drug discovery, but it's, it's interesting that it's advanced far enough at this point that um, they applied for and um, granted a patent for a machine learning model to identify the chemical compounds. Now we're gonna take a look at healthcare. And again, uh, some of the use cases, uh, certainly one for healthcare, general health, uh, public health, is epidemic or uh, communicable disease prediction and monitoring. And then the ones that we typically think of when we say we want to improve healthcare, uh, diagnosis and treatment options. So the types of data that we're gonna be looking at are patient data, uh, treatment or outcome data, and I'll get into the streaming in just a second, but if we look at that sort of the two ends of it, the demographics and the historical record, the electronic health record, this is for each individual patient. So it's the, the personal information and the treat come, treatment and outcome data is the data that we have about the general population. So we know about drug interactions, we know about uh, case studies, uh, we know someone with the particular symptoms, the individual patient that we're looking at now, 80% uh, of the time that indicated some particular disorder. So that's you know, the general, um, we have a set of uh, symptoms and we want to try and match that. All right, but I want people to also think about the idea of streaming data. So what can we do with data that we're getting right now? So besides the, the historical data and besides the case data, is there an impact? Is there something that we can learn uh, that has predicted value based on the personal state behavioral thing? And that could also be uh, things like your, um, your um, biometrics, your blood pressure, your, um, sorry, blood pressure, heart rate, all the things that you can actually check from um, a, an attached or uh, proximate uh, sensor device, but it could also be uh, that they, those things can be inferred from certain behavior. So we're gonna see as we pull all this together at the end, if I'm doing a, um, taking a look at you, if I'm your personal physician, it's one thing that you come in and you get a regular checkup. It's another thing that you come in uh, with a specific uh, complaint. You, you think you have a disorder, you have some symptoms, you wanna figure it out. If we take medicine in the future, and um, let's assume everything is opt-in for the moment, so it's not uh, mandated, but you go in and say, well, if I'm your doctor and I'm monitoring this, or I'm monitoring all my patients with a uh, visual dashboard, and I see that uh, there's some incident that is normally associated with uh, road rage, then I know that there's gonna be some biometric changes and that may change your condition. So we'd like to be able to uh, include analysis of those things. So let's take a look um, at a couple of the issues. One is 
that particularly when we get into healthcare, it's one thing to say, all right, I have all this data and based on what I know, I'm not really sure how the algorithm has come up with this, but you are a high risk. You can choose to go to another insurance company. That's fine. But if I'm going to be making um, a diagnosis about your condition, and I say, I can't really tell you how these factors work together, but it looks like you're going to have a heart attack. Well, that's something that uh, there's a lot of uh, regulatory issues about how you do diagnosis. But today, what we're seeing is that you know the explanation uh, of how you arrived at a recommendation is not as important as the efficacy or the ability to achieve the desired results. And the regulatory bodies are starting to look at this. And you know, the couple of examples that are uh, sort of well documented, things like aspirin. We know that there's um, a an improvement in positive outcomes or a reduction in negative outcomes uh, by people in certain uh, categories who take an, an 81 milligram aspirin every day. It was decades before the medical community understood the relationship, but it didn't stop uh, people from beginning that regimen. Lithium used as a mood stabilizer, um, as well as a, a component in batteries, uh, is still not completely understood in terms of the, the pharmacological benefits, but it is uh, prescribed because the statistical relationship between the ingestion at a certain level and the reduction in uh, symptoms uh, is well documented. So the efficacy is there, and if you can show that, then we're not um, not going to be as concerned as you might think that we can't go through and explain step by step what the relationships are. So that's why I wanted to just point this out. This is a fairly recent um, article in the MIT Technology Review. So with that in mind, understanding that what we want to be able to do is to demonstrate the relationship, even if we don't have all the causal data, uh, start by looking at infectious disease management. And the, the two uh, figures here, the first one is John Snow's 1854 map of cholera death clusters in London. And the other is uh, December 15th, a uh, prediction model for malaria using machine learning. And the fundamental difference between the two is although John Snow's map was very effective in uh, helping people to visualize the issue, and at uh, 1854, they still didn't have a good germ theory of uh, cholera transmission. But by being able to um, document and do uh, this type of analysis, looking at the clusters of where where cases, where fatalities were occurring, they were able to narrow it down and find the actual water pump that was responsible for poisoning the population. Uh, but it wasn't predictive, it was descriptive. And now, uh, using the same sort of concept, but with machine learning, we're at the point where we're starting to be able to predict transmission. Uh, it certainly helps that we, we know more about how um, malaria sorry, is, uh, is transmitted than we did about how cholera was transmitted in 1854. But it's kind of taking the same idea and now applying this um, machine learning approach to it. So now let's take a look at um, the, the overall um, market, if you will. And the only reason I included this one is that, uh, first of all, it's a, a good article looking at uh, the different approaches for um, uh, neural nets to, to do prediction and prognosis in cancer. But the other thing is, it's now 10 years old. And uh, you know, for a lot of people that are just getting into this and, and seeing all the hype, uh, it may be almost hard to remember that this has been going on, the, the application of machine learning and uh, deep learning to uh, cancer diagnosis for well over a decade. And so what we want to look at today is some of the stuff that's going on right now and that's being uh, implemented and will be brought into the future for uh, 
prediction uh, diagnosis uh, using machine learning. So let's look at a specific example that's getting a lot of traction. And we're going to look at diabetic retinopathy. And just to put this in context, uh, it's, we're talking here about retinal damage um, caused by diabetes that can ultimately lead to blindness, and it's a significant problem. Obviously, diabetes is a, as a uh, condition is growing. We have a, a certainly a big issue in the U.S. I know that uh, our audience for the webinars in many countries, uh, in many countries, uh, the increase in wealth is associated with a decrease in some of the health indicators that are associated with diabetes. So it's an international issue. But in the U.S., it's the leading cause of blindness for people aged 20 to 64. And it's been estimated that at least 90% of the cases could be reduced or eliminated with proper treatment and monitoring. And if you've had diabetes for over 20 years, uh, up to 80% of those people are going to have um, diabetic retinopathy issues. So the other part of it is that there's often no early warning signs. It's not something like you know, you're going to go in and say that uh, you're getting blurry vision. Uh, in the first stage, there could be no symptoms. So we need to be able to identify it um, faster and more economically. And I will admit that uh, when I was putting these slides together this week, every time I read it, I would start to get uh, psychosomatic injury or condition and uh, get blurry vision. But I don't think that this is a personal issue for me yet. Here it is in terms of uh, the actual research. And the reason I, I specifically looked at the diabetic retinopathy, besides the fact that it's a, a huge and growing um, public health issue is that so much is being done about it. So Google and Verily, which is uh, a Google company under the Alphabet umbrella of the University of Texas uh, at Austin, University of California, and a number of other groups, uh, one in India um, and Brigham Women's Hospital in, in Boston, uh, where I spent a lot of time, are all collaborating to develop and validate uh, a specific algorithm for diabetic retinopathy by looking at retinal fundus photographs. And the retinal fundus photographs are looking at the, basically looking inside the eye um, for abnormalities or, or uh, looking for uh, patterns that indicate ruptured blood vessels. So that's a, a, a research uh, project that was announced at the end of last year, uh, looking at the specific type of neural net for image classification. And this one's also a, a convolutional neural network, a feed forward. So it's similar to what um, the, the technology that was actually used uh, for the AXA system. But here they used over 128,000 images, and then they had 54 uh, professionals, licensed ophthalmologists, and residents look at each of those and go through to do the training data. And so this is uh, a, an active um, approach that's being used right now, and it ties in with the next one, which is Verily working with Nikon, and Nikon doing the, uh, the optical imaging, uh, this collaboration to uh, improve the accessibility of the screening using this deep neural network or deep learning, deep machine learning approach to um, the, the um, retinal imaging. So this is one approach. The, uh, so the reason that uh, I included this one uh, for under healthcare is that I have three examples of different groups, uh, all well-known names. We have Google, now I have Microsoft. Microsoft is partnering with an eye institute in um, India to launch the Microsoft Intelligent Network for eye care. Uh, similar approach that they're looking um, to build the, the large data set, but also to make it accessible using machine learning to advance eye care 
globally. And finally, uh, within the retinopathy, IBM uh, also this year has published um, a medical imaging uh, solution that looks at the uh, the diabetic retinopathy images, the funnel images, uh, pixel by pixel, and you can read the the full paper yourself. But basically, it's looking. At, it takes about 20 percent, sorry, 20 seconds to get an accuracy of 86 percent in classifying the disease, as well as um, a human expert. And so, once they can do this and roll it out. Uh, internationally between the combination of Google and IBM and Microsoft each working on this. Hopefully we'll get some data sharing. Uh, this is really going to revolutionize uh, that part of healthcare and democratize it because if, uh, if they had enough um, machinery to, to do the scans of everyone who is a um, moderate to high risk candidate, they wouldn't have enough ophthalmologists in the world to be able to look at those scans. So this is uh, truly one of the cases where uh, machine learning can democratize, if you will, that aspect of medicine that uh, causes blindness in so many people internationally. So now I want to look um, at using um, machine learning for what's called precision medicine and how that's going to transform healthcare and, and pharma as they go together. So precision medicine really refers to uh, medical solutions that are tailored to the individual. And a lot of times uh, what you may be seeing if you're not in healthcare or, uh, or pharma, you'll see that uh, people are excited in business about machine learning because it allows us to create very customized uh, marketing messages. You know, you go on Facebook and as you're reading through, you get an ad and you think, wow, how did they know that I was interested in a Filson hat from Seattle? Well, they know because they've put all this uh, data together. But if we can apply the same type of hyper-personalization uh, using contextual data to provide um, medical and pharmacological solutions that are just right for just you at just the right time, that's really going to transform medicine. And that's where a lot of this is going. This happens to be uh, from the MIT Precision Medicine Group, but it's, it's changing the way we approach uh, medical care to make it uh, personalized, but to make it data driven. And the way you do that is with machine learning. So uh, once again, I, I want to bring out the work, the fine work that's being done by some of the, uh, the larger companies. And there are some smaller ones that are involved in this too, but uh, really in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention a couple of the bigger ones. So here at Microsoft with uh, Project Hanover, which is AI focused on precision medicine. And they're looking at it with machine learning for cancer decision support, chronic disease management. Uh, it, it's all of the use cases that I mentioned, but it's trying to do it at the individual level. So it's taking into account more personalized data. Uh, the other one is that uh, Microsoft is, is working um, in partnership with uh, some of the universities to integrate their cloud AI, um, sorry, cloud and AI research with the medical community um, data sets to, uh, once again, uh, democratize, if you will, um, healthcare improvements. So that's Microsoft. Google, uh, just as we saw in the specific example of retinopathy, Google acquired a company called DeepMind uh, not long ago, and DeepMind is involved in some uh, clinical work here. They have focused on uh, collaboration with DeepMind was actually a, a UK based company before it was acquired by Google. And they're working with the National Health Service in the UK to try and improve quality of care and access and diagnoses uh, using the DeepMind uh, deep machine learning uh, solutions. So that's a more of a regional focus, although obviously uh, it's something that they would expect to roll out beyond that. 
And finally, in the transforming in, in healthcare, uh, IBM uh, in general, when you think IBM today, you think Watson, here just uh, several of the, the different classes of problems that Watson is being used for in healthcare and pharma. Uh, genomics, uh, drug discovery, and um, oncology are, are some of the ones that are uh, have been well publicized, but they also have uh, Watson Care Manager and health, uh, patient engagement. So they're using uh, the uh, Watson umbrella, which fortunately or unfortunately now includes a lot of things uh, beyond the original cognitive system that was a, a deep question answering system, but it includes uh, a number of machine learning algorithms and predictive analytics uh, that are being applied throughout uh, healthcare and pharma. And the last one that I'm going to uh, mention in this section from uh, in the transformation is the genomic sequencing service. And there's really not much that's more personalized than your uh, the human genome being mapped. And so this is uh, a project between IBM Watson or the Watson Group and Quest Diagnosis to use data from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, to create data sets that would be useful for personalized medicine. So as we near the end of the hour, what I wanted to do was come back to insurance and say, now that we've seen you know, a specific example, one way of looking at a 70-dimension you know, vector to do pricing, how could we integrate the types of data that we have from uh, our everything that's being collected about us, uh, frankly, and change the way we do insurance because insurance is, is related to health care. Even if you're talking automobile insurance, it's related to health care. And so I wanted to uh, leave you with some thoughts on how that fits together. And I will say that some of these examples I've actually taken from a course I taught on uh, uh, analytics and IT at uh, NYU Stern back in the year 2000. So some of this goes back um, a very long time, and we're just now getting to the point where it's fairly practical. So if we take the different data sources, and we, again, we're looking at the insurance issue, the historical, the, the streaming, how can we enable new business models that where the pricing reflects the actual behavior at a given point in time? And so, here are my three examples for auto. What if you're driving uh, and you put in your uh, your GPS, your destination, and Waze communicates with your insurance company, and you get a message that says, you know, the weather on the route that you're planning to take from Connecticut to Boston, uh, there's a storm, there's a lot of things going on, and we're going to price your policy based on the fact that you're taking a risk that we don't think is prudent and then it asks you whether or not you want to proceed. All of that is uh, feasible today. We have that information. We have the information about your car. We have the information about your driving. And now if you say, well, you're going to uh, take a route that we think increases your risk above the profile, we could do dynamic pricing right then. You could make the decision. You would know that making that drop is going to change your rate. And that could be uh, tied into your guidance system. It could be that you have to uh, have to click on it and approve. Life insurance. Get a message. You're in the store. It knows where you are. We have geospatial um, tracking. There's a, an RFID tag or other identifier on the ice cream. Now you're in the ice cream section. Get a message. Hey, you know if you uh, if you take that ice cream. It's going to change the glucose monitor reading next time we check it, which is, you know, opt-in perhaps, but based on what we know about your own biometrics, we know that we're going to be checking that. And when that goes up, your life insurance policy is going to be adjusted. Now you get the option. Do you want to see what the real cost is of the ice cream? Because it's not just the ice cream. That ice cream is going to change your blood sugar level, and that's going to change your life insurance policy. Finally, uh, property and casualty. We can have a system that looks at the news and categorizes different types of uh, news events. We can look and see that there are, uh, let's say, you know, we're in California where everything seems to go on the ballot. 
in Proposition 21. I'm just making that up. I don't know uh, what Proposition 21 is this year, but let's say you're uh, you're getting a note from your insurance company that they've determined that if this proposition passes, your risk of flooding is going to rise, and based on that, your policy is going to be adjusted. So you're getting advice from your insurance company about politics. It may sound far-fetched, but it really isn't. All of this is possible, uh, or, or certainly feasible, and uh, possible but not necessarily practical, but we're only talking a matter of uh, months and a couple of years before each of these scenarios uh, could be instituted within the insurance industry, and that would change the way we do everything. Now, a lot of people are going to be thinking, well, I don't really want the industry to change, but the fact is, as businesses uh, have the ability to offer these types of services based on behavior, um, it's going to happen. I was uh, speaking to the company uh, this week, one of our clients, who's looking at how to uh, how, how to give more accurate information to their users to to present them with the right content at the right time to to do something. And I said, well, one of the things that you can do uh, today is if you can get your customer's customer to opt in when they're looking at the content that you're showing them, you can monitor uh, the person's reaction. We can have a camera on the laptop or on the the, um, the tablet, if you will, that records the emotion. Is somebody reacting positively or negatively? You could, of course, have the, uh, have the person who's using the application uh, give feedback, but usually it's more uh, more accurate if it's done uh, passively rather than actively. This is the kind of thing that we could uh, have in your car. We can look at it and say, hmm, okay, we're looking, we're already using uh, cameras in some cases to see if somebody's nodding off based on the movement of their head. You start to look at it and you have your system that's uh, looking around, bringing in information about the weather, bringing information about traffic, bringing information from uh, your root guidance system, and then it uh, checks and sees that your, your the sentiment that you're exhibiting based on your uh, your facial expression is anger. Oh, maybe your insurance company is going to tell you to calm down. A lot of these things are so close right now, and enabled by the availability of data and the availability of machine learning. And with that, I think. We're going to turn it back to Shannon, just have a couple of minutes for questions, but uh, as always, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to anybody offline after the event or after the, uh, the webinar, and here's how to reach me. And I would just point out, again, as I try to do all the time, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, just send me a message and say that uh, this is how, how you heard about, uh, heard about me, because I tend to ignore it otherwise. Shannon, take it away. Adrian, thank you so much for another great presentation. Um, and just a reminder to everybody to answer the most commonly asked questions. I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the recording and links to the slide. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section there. And um, I hope you all can join us as Adrian's got up there that in the next webinar in August 10th, Organizing Data and Knowledge, or excuse me, in July. Oh, Hi, July. let me go. I know, I'm looking at <laughs> I'm already planning way ahead. You know, what month are we in? Uh, so next month in July, Advances in Natural Learning language processing. Um, uh, but everyone's so quiet. No questions today. That's unusual. We'll everyone your insurance policies. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, thanks as always to all of our attendees. And Adrian, thank you so much as always. And uh, we will hope to see you all next month. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Take care, folks.